All right, good afternoon. It's one o'clock on a Friday and you are in the best place, which is the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus. It is July 22nd and this is our 123rd consecutive webinar. The webinar is brought to you by the Healthy Flint Research Courting Center, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, and of course the Michigan Prevention Research Center. Yvonne Lewis will be back with us next week, but in the meantime, I'm Heather Lynn Uphold. I'm filling in for her. I'm an assistant professor with Michigan State University, as well as a co-director for the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. We want to thank and celebrate all of our partners who join us. Folks, they join us every single week. They're here to answer your questions and bring us up to date on local information. So if during the week, you know, you have a question or there's something you're curious about, be sure to bring it to the webinar. Make sure that you get it in the Q&A and we will do our very, very best to get those questions answered for you. This week, we have a wonderful, uh, really great lineup of topics and speakers for you. So we have Dr. Shanina Knighton. She's gonna talk to us about infectious disease prevention. She's been here before, so we brought her back again because there's just so much more that we can learn from her. We're also gonna be talking about treatment options for COVID, and then we'll get some important updates from the city of Lynn as well as the Genesee County Health Department. But before we get too, too much further, we do want to bring on Katie Baxter. Katie is, is a regular here on the on the webinar, but she is from the Genesee Health System, uh, and she's going to talk to us about a new resource available to us in the in the community. Thank you, Helen, for having me talk about this important topic about suicide prevention. Many of you have heard on the news nine eight eight suicide and crisis lifeline. And so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what this is and how it can be a resource for you or your family or people you know. Next slide, please. 988, everyone knows 911. We all know that number and we call and use that number if we're having a medical emergency or some kind of crisis, there's a fire or we need police help or something like that. So 988, the idea of 988 is to use that as a mental health crisis resource. So 988 is nationwide, anywhere in the United States. It's 24-7, 365 days of the year. It's very easy to remember, and it answers calls, chat, texts from anyone needing a mental health uh, support, whether that's substance abuse or somebody's having suicidal thoughts or some kind of mental health crisis. It does connect the person to a trained crisis counselor to help them address that need immediately. It did go live on July 16th, so it's available now. This is not um, any different than the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. The number 800-273-8255 does not go away. Either number will bring you to the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. The idea is, is this is an easy number to remember. It's hard to remember these 800 numbers. And when you're stressed out and you're uh, worried, um, 988 is the number we want to get in people's head as something to think about. Just like you, like Eric said, everybody knows 911. There's a language line. So if someone speaks, um, a language is a second line, a second um, language, uh, first language is not English or Spanish. There are 250 languages available so uh, the person can communicate that way. That's important to know. And the next slide, please. How is it different from 911? Well, 988 was created to really make easier access to mental health uh, services. Um, 911 does focus on emergency medical services, police, and fire supports. Um, 988 has trained crisis counselors, mental health professionals, to help somebody with um, a mental health crisis. And it's so important that people have easy access. We know the mental health crisis that we are dealing with in our country, and we want people to have easy and fast access to the care they need. The next slide, please. Why is this so important? 
all of us know of the mental health concerns have been growing in our country. Lots of people are suffering from mental health concerns, anxiety, depression, and even suicidal thoughts. We have, there's an increase of suicidal um, thoughts um, and suicide completions in our um, country. And it's very important that people get early access. Um, one of the things we know is that when people attempt suicide, that it is very impulsive. And oftentimes if they had support in place, they would make a different decision. And we know that because many people who attempted suicide and intended to complete their suicide, but something happened to intervene um, and they did not die, they tell us, the vast majority tell us that they um, regret making that action and that if they would have had some hope, support, they might have chosen a different way. So it's so important that we have um, suicide prevention initiatives. In 2020 alone, uh, the United States had one death by suicide ever, every 11 minutes. So think about that, how um, many suicides in our country and how important it is to prevent suicide. It is the leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 34 years old. So our young people are really struggling and need, need fast support. From April 2020 to 2021, there are over 100,000 individuals dying from drug overdoses. So opioid overdoses and other overdoses are um, on the rise as well and people need to know how to access care quickly. So it's so important. Next slide, please. For more information about 988, you can um, go to this link and maybe we could put this up in the chat, but it can give you more information about 988 and, um, and how to access that and, and the history behind that. Next slide, please. Please keep in mind that Genesee Health System still has our crisis hotline 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. That is not going away and we still have that available. Please utilize that for any of your local uh, concerns, mental health crisis needs. It's 257-3740. We also have a BHU um, that is not 24 hours a day at this time, but it's 496-5500, and eventually our behavioral health urgent care will be 24-7, but our number is 24-7, is available. And um, we also have text Flint to 741-741. That's another resource for people to use. So we want you to know that Genesee Health System is here to help you and support you, and 988 is just another resource to use when people um, are having difficulty, if they can't think of that crisis number, you can think of 988 quickly. So we're very pleased about this initiative and it's just another way we're working with local, state and federal partners to increase access to mental health care. So thank you so much. Um, my contact information is here. If you have any questions about 988 or our crisis services or any services that we provide at Genesee Health System, please feel free to reach out by email and my um, cell phone's available there. Thank you so much oh, and have a great weekend. Yes, Katie, thank you so much for, for bringing that information to us. I'm gonna go back a slide just for a minute. In case someone wants to snap a picture of this information, um, you know, and keep it on your phone, just in case you run into someone who really needs some support and you can reach out to the Genesee Health System uh, and get, get them connected or, or perhaps yourself connected to, to some help. Thank you, Heather Lynn. So now we're going to transition to invite Dr. Hackert, who is the medical officer at the Genesee County Health Department. President Biden tested positive for COVID this week. We learned that he's getting some treatment for that, and it's perfect timing because Dr. Hackert is going to talk to us about COVID therapeutics. Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining. Um, this is an interesting um, summary, it's recent, it's from June 28th to July 15th. They came out with a national study looking at the recent COVID cases, how many people, all the people who actually got COVID, 
how many were wearing face coverings and how many were physical distancing. Um, because we know that these newest variants are uh, much more easily transmitted. And so things that used to work quite well, physical distancing and face coverings are not working as well now. And so nationally, about 37% of the uh, controls always wore surgical, always or often, or surgical or N95 masks. Here it's a little bit lower, up just over 30%. But then physical distancing, um, nationally, about 43% avoided crowded places or events and here it's 45%. And these are among cases. And so that's what I'd like to discuss a bit because even the most careful people now are getting COVID, including myself, <laughs> um, <coughs> as you can hear. So our case, these, these statistics are actually Genesee County specific. Our cases are much higher than the past two years. While it doesn't have a date, the last one from January to June up there, that is 2022. Um, when Matt Peters, who I know uh, was on recently for you, um, showed me this, I said, oh, Matt, you have a typo in your January number, uh, 23,000. There's a zero there. And he said, no, that was actually the right number. So if you look at some of these months, um, if you wanna look at most recent one, June, of 2020, we had 280 cases in, this, in Genesee County. And then this June, we had 2,400 cases. So the cases are much higher. However, the deaths are still very low. So here's um, the graph from June, or the summary of June 19th, the last month. And as you can see, the deaths are still quite low. Um, next slide. So what does that mean with the cases going up and the deaths still remaining low? Um, it means that we have done a lot of really great work in the community. People are vaccinated. Uh, people have had infection and, you know, these would be the people who survived the first more deadly forms of COVID, but nonetheless, they do have their natural immunity. Um, so the newest ones are Omicron BA5, I think people have probably heard of that now. And then most likely um, we're starting to see, at least in the United States, and once it's here, as we all know, it goes fast, is BA2.75. Um, it was named accidentally, it's not an official name yet, but it's called Centaurus. Um, and that was someone on Twitter called it that which is like half man, half, you know, something else. So it's saying that this is a new kind of COVID with that, you know, tricky name. But going to the BA5, which we know is at least 75% of the cases now in, in Michigan, um, it's been called a whole different animal. Hey, this is Karate from Oak University. I want to talk with you about last discussion we had the retreat about the certificates. I'm um, just myself. I figured I could take you to chat about it. You can call back at 30587. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I thought, well, it's not really time for questions yet. But um, so the, the most defining reason this is a whole different animal is that. Um, it can evade previous immunity from COVID infection and vaccination. And what is important to realize when you read that though, or when you hear that, that it's not saying that it's, that the previous infection or vaccination do not protect you. They do, they actually do. And that's one of the reasons we see our death rate is so low is because while it may not prevent you from getting it, it is still preventing you from dying or having to be hospitalized for that. The other, oh, sorry. I was just gonna point, point out that um, measles is considered the most transmissible virus that we knew of before. And the transmissibility of BA5 is thought to be about the same as measles. And that means you can literally walk past someone in an airport um, and you will either potentially infect them or they could potentially infect you. So that, I just wanted to make that clear how transmissible it is. Okay, I'm not gonna read this quote. Um, I did wanna just say that this is a very, very new article um, because at around 10.30 this morning, I texted um, Dr. Sondland at the state lab and said, is it, is it just my own experience that antigen tests are not picking BA2, you know, BA5 up? 
um, or is it really true? And she said, there's nothing that has come out about this. Sorry. Nothing has come out about it. Um, in studies, however, we're not even really tracking antigens anymore because so few people are really testing. A lot of people test but not report their, their disease. And, um, you know, it's so antigens not really the way to go uh, for an ideal confirmation of it. And so when I looked at Scholar Google this morning, I was able to find something just published within the last month that does say there is reduced sensitivity of antibody tests after an infection with the Omicron variant. And this was based on things that were um, looked at from January. So it was like Omicron BA2. And right now we know that um, BA5 is going to be even more wily in being picked up. So uh, what she had told me though, which was very helpful is that she said in about or 15 minutes ago, I think she said 15 minutes ago, so right this morning, the FDA came out with um, some new recommendations, updates on recommendations for healthcare providers who use the SARS-CoV test and saying that this is, the, this is huge. And this is kind of what I was talking about with another group on Monday, and they looked a little dumbfounded when I said, you know, I'm thinking we're gonna have to start treating people without, with a negative test result. They may have negative test results, um, but they should be treated with the um, things I'll talk about in a few minutes. And so the FDA said, consider negative results in combination with clinical observations, patient history, and epidemiological information. Like what kind, and when they say epidemiological information, they say, what kind of variants are spreading? Is it BA5, which we know is you know, very transmissible. So a lot of people are getting it right now. Um, and what is happening to your patient. So if it's a mild case, if they have the sniffles and their test is negative, then you know it, it would maybe feel better about not considering treating. Um, and I'm being kind of dramatic, I'm, I'm being kind of off the, off the uh, recommendations so far, but I think we have to start talking about going that way for the fall when our case numbers are expected to go up a lot and these tests are evading, or these viruses are evading our tests. And the FDA would appear to be starting to agree with that idea. And so their suggestion today was consider repeat testing with a different um, diagnostic test if it's still suspected after receiving a negative test. But I do a lot of tuberculosis, and we see this a lot. We get negative tests, we get a confirmation one, still negative but you still have to treat the patient as you find them. And um, if you are seeing someone who has something that is really quite specific for COVID, such as interstitial bi bibasal at the bottom of both lungs, um, pneumonia, unless they have a history of COVID or um, you know, emphysema, they're a non-smoker for their whole life. Why would they have got this type of uh, pneumonia, if not for COVID. So those are the kind of situations, even with negative tests, healthcare providers should start to consider. And that's the FDA link for those who may want to see this most recent um, publication. And then also, um, this is a link, I don't know why it does have a hyperlink in it, but here's a link for um, the Michigan way of finding treatment options. So if you go to the next slide, There are basically two different treatment options for people who have um, mild to moderate COVID, and that is those who are um, having some symptoms, but they're at increased risk of severe disease. And I'm not gonna go over this list. It's pretty much the same as everyone has seen before, but I do wanna point out a couple things. BMI of 25, um, probably sharing too much, but I find between 28 and 29. So it, you can be a lot thinner than I am and still qualify for getting the oral antiviral pills. Um, and then also the um, cardiovascular disease, remember that does include hypertension. So if you have a history of high blood pressure, even if it's normal now because you take treatment, if you take um, blood pressure medication, you would qualify. 
also um, chronic lung diseases. And everything always says moderate to severe asthma. A good way to know what is moderate asthma is if you are someone who gets asthma every time you get a cold and you have to use your inhalers or a steroid inhaler when you get a cold or an upper respiratory infection, but otherwise you're pretty good, you don't have to take it on a regular basis, that's still considered moderate asthma. And the point is we're trying to reach people who are at risk for severe COVID-19. And those are the people that if they got a COVID infection in their lungs, you would need um, you know, some more intervention than the average person. It is free at this time. Pharmacies will bill your insurance if you have insurance. And again, here's this link on where to get the Paxlovid. This is something that you can get uh, test and treat for um, at, at pharmacies. But again, if they're going to require a positive test to give you the Paxlovid, you may have a harder time going to a pharmacy to do the test and treat because it may not come back positive. But if you have a provider, they can talk to you or see you um, and uh, go through the questions a little bit more and then they can prescribe packs of it and you can then pick it up at your pharmacy. Next one. Who may not be able to take it? Um, and remember, it's just who may not be able to take this. Most people can take it. You can either modify the dosing of the, um, the medication or you can, um, consider stopping a medication so that when it says provide your provider with a list of all your current medications, they really mean it. Even the things that are not prescribed, you should let them know what it is because it might just be something that just holds for a week. It's a five day course of treatment and you may just have to stop. So those people who may be on a um, anti-cholesterol medication you would want to be able to stop that. And these are the people though who need to discuss this with your primary care doctor um, before, I, and I do not recommend going to urgent care if you have a primary care doctor and you have one of these things going on. Next one. So then monoclonal antibodies. Um, I don't know how many you know, people recall like talking about what this is. Basically when we get vaccinated, we um, are trying to encourage our bodies to make our own antibodies so that when we see the virus uh, in our bodies, our bodies will fight it off with the antibodies that were created um, in response to the vaccine. When you need a boost and your body may not have either produced enough vaccines or antibodies uh, with your vaccines, if you're immunocompromised, because that means you didn't produce enough um, antibodies because of the medication you're on, or if you haven't been vaccinated at all, this is when you want to get monoclonal antibodies when you're sick. Um, there is a very limited supply now because the BA5 only works, uh, only one kind is working against BA5. But it's for use in basically the same kind of patients as the Paxlovid. Um, but again, it's a little bit, um, a little bit more of a punch. It, it, it knows exactly what antibodies and gives you a high amount of those antibodies to fight it off right away. And it should be given within seven days of symptom onset. And the indications are, and this has not changed, even though this is coming off of something that was published this month, July, uh, they still say all patients must have a COVID-19 PCR antigen test. I don't know if this is going to change and be softened a little bit, like should have as opposed to must have. Right now it's must have, um, saying that you must have a positive test. And then you must be outpatient. This is not given to people who are inpatient and also no requirement for supplemental oxygen. So if you take supplemental oxygen at night um, or during the day as well, um, you would not be a good candidate for that, but you would hopefully be contacting your doctor right away anyway. Um, then these two pieces of uh, wording that are new, uh, this is on from the FDA um, publication that came out today. And I think this is pretty cool. Medical conditions or other factors, they have, for example, race or ethnicity, that are not listed in the monoclonal antibody emergency use authorization may be associated with a high risk for progression or severe COVID-19, meaning you can get um, monoclonal antibodies as well 
based on race or ethnicity. Um, the use of the monoclonal antibodies can be considered for pregnant people with COVID-19, especially those who have additional risk factors for severe disease. And that is, that is a, a very quick and brief summary, but it does kind of give you the information and the tools you need by clicking through those links um, to get more information if you have it. And the reason I really kind of feel passionate about this right now in particular um, is that we know that BA5 is totally here. And those who are very careful, who've been very careful, uh, including myself and my husband, and including two other doctors, I got, I got COVID about a month ago from a doctor who was incredibly careful. Um, I had four negative antigen tests before I had a positive PCR test. I got the Paxlovid um, because that's easiest and most available. I got that and wasn't really getting better. Um, I was getting more uh, ill. And so I ended up getting monoclonal antibodies on top of that. And usually they make you finish it, but I was getting much more uh, severely ill. So they gave me both. And then my husband did not get it from me. Um, he was on a trip for a couple of days and he came back can still hear my voice. He came back and he got it. <clears throat> and he, he is someone who has four doses of the vaccine, incredibly carefully took his mask off while he traveled um, just to eat in restaurants. Um, and he is the one who has this bilateral um, interstitial pneumonia. And he had 10, 10 negative antigen tests and two negative PCR tests. And that's why I really was like, yeah, there's gotta be something saying that the newer variants are not being picked up by the antigen uh, tests. And indeed they are not as well. They still do. If you have symptoms, by all means get tested. I don't mean to say you shouldn't get tested. Absolutely should. It's important. It'll make your life easier to get these um, treatments. And also um, it will help you to protect those around you. And, and definitely do get tested. That's it. Oh my goodness, Dr. Hecker, this is just such important, important information for us. Uh, thank you for starting this conversation. I'm hoping that we can actually continue this and talk about testing implications and things like that next week. Um, but, but definitely thank you for helping to arm us with information about how to take care of ourselves and others. Um, we are going to move on to our next speaker. So up next is uh, Dr. Shanina Knighton. She has been back with us before, but she had a different title. Uh, now she is the Executive Director for the Center of Infection Prevention and Control Research, Practice, and Innovation. So Dr. Knighton, we're so glad to have you with us this week. Thank you. It's nice to be here, Heather Lynn. So perfect timing. We just got done talking about what to do and, and options if you do get COVID or test positive for COVID. Help us understand what, you know, what is infection prevention and what can we do to prevent us from actually getting COVID? Got it. So I was going to say it's interesting because Dr. Deb, one of my mentors, always talks about the Swiss cheese model meaning that we can talk about tests, we can talk about vaccines, we can talk about, let's say, hand hygiene, masking, distancing, we can talk about all of these different things, but how do they all work together? All of them are risk-lowering measures, which means that none of them are a cure. None of them are a 100%, you're gonna eliminate COVID, but the goal is to make sure you can minimize it and for us to really embrace a conversation of it is possible to be COVID free. What does that look like? So when we talk about infection prevention and control, infection prevention and control is the science of practice. It's the science of being able to understand what steps, what measures, what practices do we need to have in place methodically, right? In order for us to eliminate our contact with germs, our exposure. Um, that's pretty much what it comes down to. And so as an infection preventionist inside of hospitals, we are traditionally known for creating policies and guidelines that are evidence-based. 
and that information is created in a way for it to be practical and applicable to someone's everyday lives. So for example, we brought up the notion of 30% of people um, wearing masks. You know, one of um, our experts on the line brought that up, you know, and talking about the national average as well as what's going on in Flint. And I always bring up, it's one thing for someone to wear it, but it's another thing, are they wearing it correctly? And when I say, are they wearing it correctly? Are we saying that 30% of individuals are wearing masks, but it's being worn as a chin girdle? Is it being worn, you know, right beneath the nose because people may indicate that they can't breathe? And even most importantly, we forget about the important role that hands play with even being able to wear a mask. So if we are not washing our hands or sanitizing our hands properly before we put on a mask or when we take the mask off, we're essentially taking those germs from our hands and we're transferring them directly to our face by way of the mask. The mask then becomes a vehicle for those germs to be in contact with our face. So we don't think about that. The other piece of it is, is when we talk about masks, there is more work that is growing in this area, but we don't think about what happens with moisture in our mouths and that bacteria accumulates and fungus can accumulate. And the fact that there are people that do have issues with hygiene. And so when we say to ourselves that they have these masks on and that moisture is building up, what is that doing to their their mouth cavities? What is that doing, you know, in terms of people having access to even be able to change mask out? Many may not understand that if you're a mouth breather and you're breathing in that moisture and it's that exchange, you now have that being trapped inside of your mask as well as in your mouth. And so it's going back and forth. So something even as simple as just wear a mask really isn't just wear a mask. When we think about hand hygiene, it's a similar thing. So hand hygiene, only 3 to 6% of people were cleaning their hands correctly. CDC actually showed that that has increased to around 25% in their latest report, which is good, but it shows us that we have a long way to go. And so when I say we have a long way to go, in their report, they actually brought up that people still may not clean their hands after blowing their nose or after coughing. And so the basic things that we don't take into consideration. And so when we think about hand hygiene, making sure that we're cleaning our hands properly, we might oftentimes be missing where the thumbs meet the, um, meet the webs of your fingers. We're oftentimes not thinking about our fingernails, but just as important as it is to wash, we don't think about how important it is to dry. If your hands are still wet and you're touching surfaces, then you're likely to pick up more germs on your hands because it then it's just becoming a fluid that is just going to build up on your hands. And so I always bring that up, Heavenland, um, as being very important. My emphasis around masks, proper mask wearing, and proper hand hygiene is really based off of the fact that even if, let's say, the vaccines start to wear off or not work as well because we're starting to understand how rapidly you know variants may be changing these are protective measures that had effectiveness before we had vaccines however we have tended to kind of put them to the side opposed to making it a toolkit for individuals to say yes you are vaccinated yes you may have access to these treatments but it is very important to not downplay these practices. And unfortunately, these practices, which were our saviors in so many words, before we had access to vaccines, have now been minimized and we have continued to now ignore how effective they were early on with being able to decrease the spread. So I would, I would say stop there because I'm sure you probably have some more. <laughs> You are on a roll. It's all good information. I do want to make sure that, you know, we have some wonderful community health workers, folks on the call that are panelists. So if you folks want to come on video and join this uh, conversation and ask Dr. Knighton a question or folks, you know, if you have a question, you want to put it in the in the Q&A, make sure you do that. 
Um, she just has a ton of information and resources we, and we wanna make sure that we get your questions answered. But while you're doing that, I see uh, Dr. Gordon, Gwendolyn have come on. So if you all have questions, feel free to, to ask Dr. Knighton. Well, you know, working in the community with so many um, of our families uh, here at GHS, we can provide um, a collab with our community partners um, collaborative care. Um, we provide, of course, uh, behavioral health and mental health services um, through our clinicians here, uh, but also through our clinics. So when we find consumers that don't have a primary care physician, we can refer them out. Um, what are your thoughts on that um, collaborative care model and even the patient care model that we use? Do you think it's most effective in informing um, residents or consumers about the infectious diseases, especially COVID, you know, informing people of the, the COVID as we move forward? It is, Gwendolyn, thank you for that question. I think that a collaborative care model can, it's, it's good, but I know that we can do a more effective job. And I had this conversation with Heatherland yesterday around the topic of hygiene poverty and how that relates to infection prevention and control. And so as a nurse, you know, it's one thing inside of a hospital for us to ensure, let's say, that patients can shower there, that they can practice oral hygiene there, that they can do all of these things. But you and I both know that when the guidelines are written, they're written from a place of privilege to me, meaning that we assume that everyone has clean running water at home in order for them to be able to clean their hands. We assume that people can go home and they can launder their uniforms. So if they came in contact, let's say, with they were in an area of high transmissibility of COVID or other germs, can they really take their uniforms home and be able to launder them regularly like they should? Um, when we're talking about dental hygiene, we know that a lot of our families are in that gap range where they may spend 30% of their income on just being able to live. So that's their rent cost. And now they have to then split the rest of their funding between their healthcare costs between their car notes, between gas. We, it's so many other things that they have to then prioritize or I would say really gamble with. And so when we throw in the factors of, hey, now you need extra masks. Now we would like for you to make sure that you have extra disinfectants in your home. If you are a home that let's say has multiple generations in there and it is a compact living space, it's very easy for when one person to get COVID, everything to tend to want to spread because the guidelines are not written where everyone can have an isolated room that they can be in. And so when I think about a collaborative care model, it brings to me the notion of us checking our privilege and really understanding what does it mean when people have to go home. And I say when the music stops because you're in the hospital, you have all of this care that's around you, but when someone is getting ready to go home, being able to have those uncomfortable conversations, asking them about the running water, asking them do they feel comfortable with the water, let's say being clean, um, soap. So this is something that we don't even mention, but body soap. So if the whole family is, let's say, bathing with one bar of soap, Bar soap in healthcare settings is banned because you can just literally spread the germs around. So if it's a home and let's say they're using bar soap and cousin Jenny just had an abscess um, and she's using that bar soap and then this person has to go use that bar soap, we're not thinking about how all of those germs are then transmitting in between those family members just in itself. And so education around topics such as that is very important. I kind of freaked Heather Lynn out because I was telling her about the fact that we can even sometimes go in a home like that said it looks nice, right? But then when you get in there, the hygiene around their wound care may not necessarily be reflective of what they should be doing. You might see those dressings laying on a mantelpiece you know, infested with bugs or just different things. And when I say bugs, I'm not saying the ones that we can't see, but flies and different things. 
so my thing is really truly understanding where people are with their hygiene understanding where they are with infection prevention and control and asking ourselves do they have the tools to be empowered to be able to practice it because otherwise you can feel hopeless and you can feel less confident if you don't have the tools to be able to do so so when our let's say physician colleagues when our nurse colleagues our nurse practitioner colleagues our social workers our occupational therapists i can go on and on you know about how many people community health workers how many people will touch a patient is making sure we're all on the same page and is very patient-centered and that we understand the resources that they have available and the situation that they're in in order for us to give them the best um, information regarding their care I appreciate your response because those are things that we um, assist our consumers with on a regular basis. We have what we call a, a care closet, and it was primarily started by um, the navigators here at GHS, and we can provide some of those services, um, some of those items, some of those cleaning products um, on a, on a as-need basis because it's so important that they understand even in those um, isolated uh, environments, mm -hmm. because they don't have a separate place to quarantine. It's important that we have those conversations with our consumers on a regular basis and even expand it to uh, the powers that be that those are additional resources that are needed um, for families so that they can be aware of how to stop the uh, diseases or the even something as simple as what we thought was so simple, the common cold and uh, coronavirus, that's how we stop it, making sure that they have clean masks and so on and so forth. So thank you. I appreciate your conversation today. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. All right, Dr. Gordon, do you have a question? I see, it looks like you're out in a clinic or someplace live. Yes, uh, yes, I am. I'm at the Flint Farmers Market today. We're at the Flint uh, Black Expo. Um, so we're doing a clinic. So also, you know that during this time, I don't know, can you hear me well? Uh, mm -hmm. Pandemic fatigue. You know, everyone's at pandemic fatigue, you know, with all the measures and you know about wearing the mask. I keep, of course, I keep my mask on, but just like uh, Dr. Hacker said, I also had COVID myself. So how can we encourage, you know, with the pandemic fatigue, and keep encouraging people to use these uh, or mitigate the risk of these pre protective measures or preventative measures. How do you uh, suggest that we continue to um, educate or to encourage people? Well, you know, with the pandemic fatigue era, it's like kind of want it to be over. It was like when you get fatigued, you just don't want to do anything. So how can we keep on encouraging what we can suggest this be? Absolutely. And I was going to say, I, so I always start with telling people this might be the pandemic that has literally touched every single person, but it's not the first bug, you know, that has come to become an outbreak or come yeah. to being something more serious. So I tell people stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Because what we are still realizing is that we are all experiencing science on a live stage right now. And so for individuals that have had COVID in the past, it's reminding them you're not aware of the long-term consequences and how this might affect your health later. For individuals that have not had it and somehow feel like they missed it, it's still reminding them that it can impact you at any point. For example, um, studies came out recently that shows that women that got COVID during their third trimester, they had a higher chance of delivering babies that had neurological issues. And so that's just one example. Um, there's also people that have had the cardiac issues. So postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and that's happened amongst teenagers as well as young adults where their heart rate just goes skyrocket really fast and some of them may end up blacking out and passing out that can be very scary for someone that's driving it can be scary for someone that's working out and it can lead to like let's say other consequences such as some sort of head trauma if they are to fall and those are just two examples right but when we start to have the conversation with our younger generations and with our older and we think about quality of life, 
it's the reminder that this is not going to last forever and that I remind them that when we think about our lives just in general we all may have had that challenge where it seemed like it was never going to be over with but then when we look back at it it seems like it was just a small blur because we've overcome it and so it's reminding individuals of that it's telling them you know right now we have monkeypox that's on the rise we have a deadly candida auris uh which is a, a fungus that's there you know that's out there um over in ghana so they have had marburg um virus and marburg virus is similar to um ebola and we're talking about an 88 percent fatality rate and no it's not here in the u.s but we have to remember we're only a plane ride a train ride a bus ride away from us coming in contact with these germs so when we stay ready we don't have to get ready and we also have to understand that so many of us don't have primary care doctors or just don't go to the doctor regularly enough for us to understand that even if we seem like we're asymptomatic from COVID, it can represent itself in some other way in our bodies because our ACE2 receptors, which which is honestly what COVID seems to attack or act on, is throughout our whole bodies, which is why we have people with the brain fog and, you know, which is a real thing and something that's chronic and long right now. And so people don't think, how can that really throw me off of my life goals if I can't even remember how I'm supposed to? And so we all are in that space. And so it's just really reminding people, do you want to make this sacrifice now so that way you can have a better quality of life in the long run because we are still finding things out about it? Thank you. Excellent response. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great questions. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker because I want to make sure we wrap everything up in time. But... Dr. Knighton will still be with us for the next 15 minutes or so. So make sure you get those questions in the Q&A uh, and we'll do our very best to get them answered. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, next we have Alan Harris. He is with Michigan State University in the Division of Public Health and he is bringing us our COVID data update for the week. All right, thanks Heather Lynn. Uh, when we look at the numbers, Genesee County as a whole had a decrease. The decreases are slowing overall. So that's an indication that sort of the bottom numbers are coming to an end. And just like Dr. Hackert said, we can start to anticipate an increase pretty soon as if you look at the rest of the state of Michigan, the other counties and the UP and throughout the middle and northern, they're starting to experience increases. Uh, so it's just a matter of time before we also um, also when you see sort of the jumps that go up and then back up, back up, go down and then back up, that usually means there's like sort of two surges, one's ending, the other one's beginning, that type of thing. Um, so again, like the, these are still relatively low numbers, especially when you compare it to the January that we had. Um, but as it increases, just keeping an eye on uh, these patterns. And we're always going to be looking at different demographics, gender, race, um, age, uh, looking at those closer with the nuanced uh, background of disparity. So we're, we're keeping all that in mind. Also, if anyone has any ideas that they want to look at, if there's if there's questions that they have that, that they want to, they think it would be an interesting map or an in interesting graph, please just let us know your ideas, even if it's just like top of your head, uh, what is it, info at hfrcc.org. Yeah, that'd be great. That's exactly it. Thank you so much, Al. We're, we're always glad when, when you come and, and share information with us. Last week, we got an update on maps and, and things like that. So we'll, we'll be sure to keep that information continuing uh, as we move forward. So thank you. All right, next. So we have a new person from the city that's joining us. We have Katie O'Neill. So she is the marketing and communications specialist for the city of Flint. And she's got a couple of updates for us. Hi, it's great to be here today. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to share with you is uh, our city of Flint community navigator pilot program. 
Um, this is funded by the Federal Small Business Administration, and it's a small business development program housed within the city of Flint. So we help new entrepreneurs go from concept to market, and we consult with existing businesses to help them grow. By enrolling in this program, small businesses can get free help with business plans, loan eligibility, accounting infrastructure, marketing and branding tools, and truly so much more. So many free resources within this ecosystem. And one of the opportunities we have coming up is an access to capital event at Burston Fieldhouse. You can join us for this free information session Wednesday, August 10th from 10 a.m. from sorry, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, you can get more information on the City of Flint's Facebook page. We do recommend that you register to attend, but if you forget, please come anyway. We'd love to connect with you there. We'll have several groups um, available to help both new entrepreneurs and existing small businesses learn about opportunities to access capital. Um, one of our new businesses that we love to celebrate is Laisha Johnson's skincare business, LJ Essentials. She has a new brick and mortar location on University Avenue, and she was able to access capital for her business through the City of Flint's resource ecosystem. We would love to help you do that too. And if you can't attend this upcoming event, you can contact Tyler Bailey, our small business specialist at tbailey at cityofflint.com. And he can help small business owners and new entrepreneurs enroll in the program and start connecting you with all the resources that you need. Um, I'd also like to share uh, this past Wednesday, the Crim Fitness Foundation unveiled the renovated Crim Plaza in downtown Flint. It's located in front of the Riverfront Center across the street from the U of M Flint Pavilion. And the Crim Foundation is planning for this outdoor space to be used for uh, training program meetups, community yoga and mindfulness, employee wellness programs. It's a great space for organic placemaking activities. Um, really anything that we as a community can imagine, we can have happen in this outdoor space. Um, it's just one piece of promoting a culture of health and outdoor activities in the city of Flint. And then finally, I'd like to share with you this past weekend, the renovated and expanded Sloan Museum of Discovery opened to the public with new interactive exhibits exploring science and history. This is a free educational resource for Flint and Genesee County residents. The new Discovery Hall includes a water table, a maker lab, a spaceship earth climber, and a huge variety of earth science exhibits. There's also an early childhood gallery um, that promotes early literacy skills. And the new history exhibits offer an immersive experience with inclusive Flint history stories, great for both kids and adults. Again, admission is free for Genesee County residents because of the arts and culture millage that the voters passed in 2018. Uh, there will be a fee for future traveling exhibits, but those core hands-on science and history exhibits are gonna continue to be free for Flint and Genesee County. So we're super excited about that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, Katie. This is great information, you know, and if you guys are, are trying to beat the heat this weekend, head over to the Sloan and, and you can enjoy their exhibits and some air conditioning. Up next, we've got Blair Warren. She is with the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, and she's going to talk about two uh, health updates, health equity updates that she'd like to share. Hi, um, it's great to be talking with you all today. Um, so um, I just have a couple of policy updates for the state of Michigan. These are available to read and review in the newest um, Flint Center Health Equity Solutions Health Equity Brief that was published on July 8th, um, along with additional COVID data and information. So the first policy update has to do with improved access to quality childcare. Governor Whitmer signed House Bills 5041 through 5048 to improve the accessibility of quality, affordable child care for families and to increase the support for child care businesses. These bills ensure that families can access licensing reports, allow experienced providers to serve more children, expand child care within multi-use buildings, and offer extensive networks for coaching and professional development, among others. 
For example, the payment structure for providers who rely on public subsidies to care for children from low income families will change. So the payments will no longer be based on attendance, but rather provider networks will be given contracts to care for children ages zero to three, which will guarantee a steady income source even when children are absent. This will give providers more incentive to care for younger children who are the most costly to care for because they require more adult attention. Overall, uh, these bills will enhance the quality and accessibility of childcare support in the state of Michigan, particularly for lower income families. Um, the second policy update has to do with federal funds to support AmeriCorps members. We in Flint have a long history of AmeriCorps members coming to do work in the community. Um, AmeriCorps engages individuals with full or part-time service positions nationwide over a 10 to 12 month period. The purpose is to connect individuals with organizations um, to help address specific challenges in communities around the country. Um, in Michigan, so the Cram Fitness Foundation and the United Way of Genesee County are two of 23 organizations set to receive federal funds through the Michigan Community Service Commission. Overall, the Michigan Community Service Commission will award $13.4 million to support over 1,100 AmeriCorps members working across the state to address critical issues around education, disaster preparedness, environmental stewardship, health, and others. These dollars will be leveraged with an additional 10.3 million in matching funds from the private sector and other sources as well for a combined investment of $23.7 million. This will further enhance AmeriCorps support for and involvement in Michigan communities. All right, wonderful. Wonderful news for Michigan, wonderful news for Flint. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Blair. Uh, we also have an update about an upcoming event. Dr. Wolford, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the symposium? Hi, Evelyn. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so this has been a wonderful seminar, seminar uh, webinar today. And if you love the information provided on the webinar, you are going to absolutely um, be thrilled by the symposium. Um, we are scheduled to have our, uh, our annual symposium this year on September 30th. It will be in person at the Flint um, Riverfront Center. And I like to think about it providing information, inspiration, and interconnection because we will be doing all of that. Lots of information about the latest research in Flint. Um, we will be hopefully inspiring new work and new partnerships, and we'll be helping to form those interconnected, uh, all those connections with networking um, activities built in throughout the day. Um, one deadline that I really want us to mention today is that. On Monday at 5 p.m., that's the last, that's the close of the time when we'll accept um, any of the abstract submissions. So if you've been working in Flint and you have research, service, education, information that you would like to share as a poster presentation at the symposium, please go to the website that has been put into the chat and put in your information there before 5 p.m. on Monday the 25th. So you have time. We look forward to you uh, presenting your information at the symposium and being able to be pre present to hear our wonderful keynote speakers and to meet others who are working avidly to improve health in Flint. So hopefully that answers the information. We'll be providing updates regularly between now and then and registration will open in a couple of weeks. Um, and so, Hevelyn, um, I'm going to hand it back to you, but I, um, we'd like the opportunity to keep putting this information out there. We want you to share it with all of your friends and families. This symposium is for community, academics, anybody who's interested in research, science, and health in Flint. Well, I'm signing up for sure. That was a, that was a great description, Dr. Wolford. I can't wait for the, for the September symposium. We are nearing the end. So uh, community health workers, social workers, you are in our hearts and we are so appreciative of all of the work that you do. Make sure that you get those continuing education units and contact hours. The screen will pop up once you exit out of this webinar. 
uh, and it will send you right to a Qualtrics survey so that you can fill out the needed information. We can get you settled uh, with the with the um, with the certificates that you that you've earned. So and reach out if you have any questions. You can reach out to Atoisha. Uh, her email is there on the screen, and she's always ready to answer your questions. As always like us on Facebook. And here's the thing with the YouTube channel. If you missed last week's conversation, which was really, really good about long COVID, um, go, go to the YouTube channel, go to the Facebook page. You can find those videos there. You can find all of our 123 uh, videos there, as a matter of fact, um, and, and check those out. But you can also email us with questions. We always are, are looking for questions to answer and content to share. So make sure you reach out at info at hfrcc.org, or you can give us a call. Uh, that phone number is 810-835-2130. Make sure you join us next week for session 124. We're gonna be talking, this is a teaser. So um, think about this one. We're gonna be talking about Alzheimer's and COVID. Uh, so some really great information. We want you to stay informed and come back to us next week uh, for the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus.